Uh, welcome everybody for the afternoon session of the new conference. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker in the afternoon session, Dr. Michał Mishkiewicz, uh, my former PhD student. Successful, yeah. And Michał uh, uh, was awarded the Balak uh, Prize for Exceptional uh, Doctoral Dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh? The camera is totally okay. So, uh, uh, so it's my pleasure to 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 introduce uh, Michal's talk, uh, and uh, I would like to start in in, in a very uh, general picture. So, this is a, a mini conference. Each lecture is uh, devoted to different area of mathematics. So, if we look on the mathematical landscape where we land now. So we are somewhere in the borderline between analysis and geometry. And the, uh, the main topic of uh, Michal dissertation and uh, to also to his uh, today's talk is related to the task of uh, uh, finding a, a proper way to uh, describe geometrical objects uh, by, some, by means of mathematical analysis. And his PhD dissertation was devoted to uh, so some, somewhere on this landscape. We see, for example, sub, such classical topics as minimal surfaces or uh, surfaces with prescribed curvature. We see this. And so Michal's work was related to the following problem. Imagine that you have two Romanian manifolds and you are considering mappings between those uh, objects. Miha will introduce in detail which precise class of mappings he is considering. And somehow our question is how we can, uh, so we can ask many questions. One question is how we can describe geometrical properties of these objects by means of those mappings. This is one question. And the other question is how geometry of these objects influences regularity of those markings. So today's talk is devoted to this second question. And uh, Michal will speak about the so-called uh, harmonic mappings. He will explain himself in a moment. And uh, it's like this, if you have those two Romanian manifolds, if we look locally, what's going on, we can imagine that the domain manifold is flat, but the target manifold remains as, as a manifold. And it is known, and those are classical results by now, uh, uh, the analysis started somewhere half a, uh, half a century ago. So this is known that those mappings their regularity is influenced by the geometry of the target manifold. And in particular, not always such mappings are smooth. Therefore, we have singular set in the domain. And now our task is to say how this singular set, what is the regularity of this singular set? So how, how much, how bad, how bad does those mapping can behave? The mappings we are interested in are related to uh, some energies. So uh, most often those are energy minimizers. So not only uh, the area of research is related to analysis geometry, but also possible applications to, to mathematical physics. And uh, so now the question is how the geometry of the target manifolds influences regularity of the mapping and regularity of the singular set uh, in the domain. Uh, I think the whole story, uh, Michal will explain the, the, the whole story, <laughs> and uh, I will now let Michal speak, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I tried my best to put everything uh, that is important on the slides. For example, you see here uh, my co-authors, uh, which are responsible for some of the results here. Uh, one exception is that I didn't include any thanks for my uh, supervisors. Uh, 
Anja Zudarska Golshin, Paweł Strzelecki, thank you very much for these years and well for coming here also. Let me take where's here. Okay. Uh, I need to click on it, right? Hmm. All right, this should work. Yeah. Uh, so a quick uh, outline. Uh, I was asked to make it appropriate for undergraduate students. I don't see any here, but well, I was prepared to do that. Oh, uh, you're cheating, really. <laughs> So I will do it anyway, because this is the, these are most of my slides. Um, so there will be a very gentle introduction. Then I will talk about, well, uh, I will give a review of uh, the literature about singularities of singularity of minimizing cognitive maps. And then if time allows, I will sketch two results that were included in the dissertation. The first one uh, is an estimate on the size of singularities, how many of them there are, how, how how long they are, how much area they have. And the second one is about the regularity of it. It sounds contradictory, but you can study the singular set. It's, um, it happens sometimes and it's a manifold and you can ask how regular is it. So, uh, as I said, a gentle introduction. Uh, you all know soap bubbles, they minimize area with prescribed volume. So you have some prescribed volume of air inside a bubble. It, well, wiggles a lot, but then it turns into a round sphere, which minimizes area. Uh, this is what we call, well, not minimized surfaces, but, uh, but uh, yeah, with prescribed volume, that would be it. Another example are geodesic curves. Again, we're minimizing something. So we want to get from here to Utah. And uh, well, the shortest path is called the minimizing geodesic. Surprisingly, uh, the map is for Greenland, right? It looks surprising, but if you look at the globe, it isn't. And if you take a flight, then, then you also know how this works. Mm. Okay, these were two kinds of problems. Both were related to minimizing harmonic maps, but let me give you a landscape uh, of what we can expect from problems like this. So there are bad and good problems. Uh, you can say that a good problem is what Adamar uh, would call a well-posed problem. There are three, uh, three properties. One is existence, that we want the problem to have a solution, uh, sufficiently regular to make sense of a solution. Uh, uniqueness, we want it to be unique, all right, only one solution. And stability, so there is some underlying boundary data on which our solution depends, so we want to have it continuous in terms of this boundary data. So uh, these are the three uh, things that you could expect. And the, uh, the problem I'm, I'm going to introduce is quite ill-posed as opposed to harmonic functions. So these two are strictly related. But harmonic functions is like a very classical example of a problem which is well-posed. Uh, well, it satisfies all of these. With harmonic maps, well, uh, yes or no uh, about existence. So if you're tolerant enough, they have solutions, there are solutions. If you're not, then, then no. Uh, but the solutions are non-unique and also non-stable. So let me illustrate it on the two examples uh, I already gave you. These, as I mentioned, these are already some cases of uh, harmonic maps. So uh, there's lack of uniqueness uh, for geodesic curves. So if you go from here to Utah, there's just one path. If you go from the North Pole to the South Pole, there are many, like all of the meridians work. So it's non-unique. Also non-stable, for example, in the sense that if you wiggle this uh, S a bit, if you take a nearby point, then, well, then it is unique. But if you uh, wiggle it a little bit, then meridians go like wild around the globe. So this is what I would call non-stable. Um, the same thing happens with soap bubbles. So uh, if you blow it long enough, you probably uh, sometimes it happens that you have two bubbles uh, joined together and then they are not smooth round spheres. Uh, there are things like this. You can see these uh, junctions uh, in the shape of a Y, which is like cannot be, it's not a smooth band, right? 
Uh, there are also tetrahedral junctions like this. Uh, one can prove that these are the only two possibilities. But the outcome is, well, this is a solution that the physics give us, gives us. So if we prescribe the mathematical problem as finding a smooth manifold, which minimizes blah, 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 then we would say, OK, there are no solutions with some boundary data. So this is, you don't see a boundary here, but you can use a wire, like put it in soap, pull it out, and then like this wire uh, serves as a boundary data. So if you are restrictive uh, enough, if you want things to be smooth, then there are no solutions. If you're tolerant, if you allow for singularities, you have to make sense of it, but then there are solutions. And uh, I mentioned one well-posed problem. So just to illustrate how good problem uh, it really is, uh, let me mention well Laplace's problem. So we have a prescribed function on the boundary. Any questions? No, no. Um, a prescribed. Hmm? He can, he can, he's pretty smart and can come up with reasonable examples very fast. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so, uh, given a function on the boundary, uh, we, uh, we want to extend that function to the inside and minimize what we call the Dirichlet energy, the integral of the gradient square. Uh, this is the variational formulation of that. You might uh, know it in, in another guise as a solution of Laplace equation, which we will see later is more or less the same thing, or at least related. And well, there's nothing, uh, nothing uh, surprising about it. There's a very explicit solution. You can prove it's unique. And because it's very explicit, you can also see that it depends continuously on phi, right? If you perturb phi, it only perturbs the integral a bit. And it's also smooth, which could be surprising uh, if you don't know uh, elliptic regularity theory. So even if phi is non-smooth, then if you perturb it in x, then actually it doesn't matter how smooth phi is because the integral is smooth. So. Harmonic functions are smooth even if there's non-smooth boundary data. There is some smoothing in it. Uh, that's well, uh, non, not so common in other problems. So these are harmonic functions. Harmonic maps are uh, a similar thing. So now I'm also going to minimize the duration energy, but now it's a map between two manifolds, two Riemannian manifolds. Uh, I to have a boundary data, and I want you to have the smallest energy among all admissible maps. So just to give you some details that won't be important uh, in the sequel, but these are manifold, remaining manifolds. What I described with a NABLA um, is the differential. So you might be more used to using a, uh, a lowercase d for that, right? It's the differential. Uh, it's a linear map between uh, tangent spaces, and then I use the, the simplest norm that I could use. You could call it the hilbert schmidt norm, or it's like Euclidean, it's the L2 norm that uh, comes out of the inner product you could have there. So the, the simplest setting that could be. And so why do we care about minimizing harmonic maps? So I already gave you one example. Uh, minimizing geodesic curves are an example if the domain is one-dimensional. Right, because then you have a map from, say, um, a segment into your manifold, it's a curve, a geodesic one. In dimension two, uh, you get uh, parameterizations of minimal surfaces under some additional assumptions. It's actually a fruitful connection, but uh, again, that's not relevant for today. And there's, uh, well, it's relevant for differential geometry in in general, and there are some certain models in physics that I'm not an expert in uh, that also use uh, minimizing harmonic maps as models. And from now on, uh, I told you that the details are not important. From now on, I will uh, work with map from Bn, the flat Euclidean ball, into S2. So you can, uh, you don't need Riemannian manifold theory to make sense of that uh, because S2 is just a subset of R3, so everything is very explicit. And why I'm doing this, um, it doesn't matter much what I, what I put here. 
Uh, well, there are uh, results about uh, harmonic maps that depend on the topology of the domain. But as far as I'm looking at singularities, which are a local phenomenon, then it actually doesn't matter what's the manifold. I only want to look at a small portion of it, which is almost flat if you zoom in. So that's not important. And I choose S2 because a lot more can be said about S2 than about the general case. All right. I told you that there's a connection between minimizing energy and solving a PD. You're probably not surprised, but just in case, uh, all right, let me show it. You, you see the thing in the other. Three dots. Three dots? Yes, and then there is the hide um, something, hide the floating of this one. Ah, uh, great. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. It's like, it's been years of COVID and now I learned it. Uh, all right, so like, if you have a function, you ex if you have a minimum, you expect the um, the derivative to be zero. This is for scalar functions, for functions that depend on functions. This is what we call functionals. Well, it's a bit different, but this is what you do. So if you have a minimizing function, like a harmonic function, then for any smooth pi, if you perturb it, so uh, for each t you have u plus t phi, like a candidate function, because this thing, this thing here, as a function of t, has a minimum at t equals zero, it's an well, it's a function of a real variable. You can take the derivative. The derivative has to be zero, right? And what this gives you, I have to click again. Uh, you probably know what this gives you. Um, but you differentiate. Uh, you get right. There was gradient squared, so now you have two times the gradient of that times the gradient of this other thing. If you integrate by parts, you get the Laplacian thing. Okay, so the Laplacian is defined as a sum of second order derivatives i i, and already in the weak sense, you, there there is something subtle about it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I looked up the history. I think Lagrange didn't uh, make a big deal out of it, but a priori say you assume here that u is c1, you minimize the, the energy, which only assumes you have one derivative. But then here, there are two derivatives. So I'm not supposed to write this, right? But I'm writing it in the weak sense, let's say. Or I assume things are smooth. This is what Lagrange did so many years ago. Um, and the case I want to talk about is similar. So now if I if I have a minimizing harmonic map from Bn to S2, then if I have perturbations, I have to normalize them, right? So I look at u plus t5, but it like the perturbation takes me away from the sphere, so I normalize it. And because of this normalization, if I take the derivative, there is some leftover stuff, right? There has to be. Um, and because of that, if you integrate by parts, this is the PDE you get. It's a bit different. Uh, instead of a zero, you have this. You could expect that because of the smoothing effect the Laplacian has, the same thing happens for this other equation, but it's really very different. Uh, that's because this thing here, if this was a linear equation, like two times u, everything would be fine, but there's a nonlinearity. So it's something nonlinear with respect to uh, the gradient. And uh, if you want to look at it, from the analytic angle, this is to blame for singularities. And singularities, uh, I will call a point singular if my map is discontinuous at P, meaning that it cannot be extended, say, uh, continuously, or cannot be represented by a continuous function to, to be really precise. And uh, there's a dichotomy. If you have a regular point at which you have continuity, then it follows automatically that the map is smooth. So it's either discontinuous or smooth. So if it's continuous, the, the smoothing effect kicks in. All right, so let us see examples, uh, examples of singularities. Next slide. Yes. So uh, this is the basic example. A map from B3 to S2, that's just projecting everything onto the boundary. And uh, right, you, you could say, OK, it's not defined uh, at the, the origin. I could say, OK, define it as any point you like. And then it's discontinuous. 
or you could say that it's a sub-left map, in which case, well, it is not represented by a smooth map. In any case, there's a singularity algorithm, right? Whatever, whichever way you want to look at it, there's something wrong about this point in here, this one point. And actually, it's not, uh, uh, not a curiosity using mathematical models. I mentioned that there are some models in mathematical physics, like liquid crystals. Liquid crystals have these, like, they are crystals, they are like sticks, more or less. And they, 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 they want to so, uh, be put in a continuous shape. And sometimes they want to minimize some energy. And if you, well, if you look at it, this is what happens with crystals. So usually these crystals are uh, aligned continuously. And then sometimes there's a crack, there's a defect, which looks like this, which corresponds to this mathematical model. So it's not only mathematics, it's also real life in some sense. Um, so this is in dimension three, there's a point singularity. In higher dimensions, you could do uh, the same thing. You take a map that forgets n minus three uh, coordinates and does the same thing on the three remaining coordinates that we did before. So you project on the, on each slice, you project onto the boundary, uh, and then like glue all these boundaries together. So that's uh, that's a picture. And now you have a whole line of singularities, uh, a line. It's an n minus three dimensional Euclidean subspace of singularities. Okay. And okay, I could go on and on with examples, but actually these are, in some sense, the only examples that one could get. This is why I like S2, because you can actually classify uh, possible singularities. So at a small scale, if you look at this, say, liquid crystal, if you zoom in and in and in, uh, in the limit, this is what you get. So there's a classification. Uh, and in higher dimensions, you, you see that may be rotated, but uh, this map. All right, so I already told you uh, we have, right, say, maybe C1 maps. We have some derivatives, right? We have to, because we minimize the energy. But then we have singularities. So how to uh, make the two agree? We introduce sub left maps. Uh, you already saw a weak formulation already in the 18th century, right? And now we make it a definition. So we have a map. Or which is in L2, we call it, uh, we say it is of sub left class W12. If there is a vector field in L2 that satisfies the integration by parts formula. So the integration by parts formula, like in a verbose form, is exactly that, right? It's an integration by parts with respect to the J variable. Um, so if you have a gradient, then this is true. And vice versa, it's not really true. So uh, this vector field, it pretends to be the gradient, meaning that integration by parts always works. Otherwise, it's not really the gradient. It's not, right, it's not the classical gradient. But uh, in most occasions that we need it to, it pretends to be just that. Um, if there is a vector field X, and then not you. No, you. no, 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 no. Let me say it again. The notation you, is like Okay, yes, for, you, for each okay. x, this is an identity which has to follow for, for every, every x. x. For every x, for every x, yes. Okay. I see. So you has to have something which looks like there, there has to be a, another object which under integrating by the parts behaves like the derivative group. Yeah. Uh, and the dot is the other product. Yeah, so here is the scalar product. Here is the scalar product between, well, things like this. But, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is why I wrote this one to make things precise. We're working our end, so we, we don't have to work too hard. Um, right. So I am not going to go into the details or any PDF stuff inside. But if you do, this is what you're working with. You integrate by parts every second line of the proof. Um, and so, okay, uh, these are maps into R3. Uh, I will consider maps uh, into S2. Okay, I, P equal to, say, uh, which are just sublet maps into R3 that map uh, into the sphere almost everywhere. This is a bit subtle, right? 
almost everywhere because these are just L2 maps. So it doesn't make sense to make uh, assumptions everywhere. All right, so I already told you, well, I already gave you some examples of singular points, singularities. Uh, so let me tell you how large the singular set can be. It all started uh, in the 80s. I, Anya was kind to tell us at the beginning. Uh, so Shannon Ollenbeck proved that the singular set has Hausdorff dimension at most n minus three, which is consistent with our examples, right? Uh, there was an example with n minus three dimensional singular set, which was just a subspace. So this can happen. Uh, it was proved that it's a rectifiable set. I will mention that uh, later. What that means, but it was proved by Simon in the 90s in the case of real analytic targets. And in the general case in 2017, I made this timeline here uh, exactly for the purpose of showing the large gap between this age and this age. Uh, uh, it was Neighbor and Valtorta that made a big breakthrough. And I didn't understand the difference between Simon and Okay, so uh, this is a difference in generality. Simon proved it for some target manifolds. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, but you could say, okay, so actually Simon proved it for us too, in particular. Neighbor and Valtorta proved it for all other manifolds. Yes, uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for. Uh, mentioning that it was not clear. And then uh, it has locally finite uh, Hausdorff measure. So it's not only an n minus three dimensional object, it has finite measure, which was proved recently. And then um, you can put an, like, uh, an explicit bound on the size of singularities. If you have a prescribed map phi on the boundary, then the size of the singular set is at most a constant time it's n minus one energy. So this was proved in dimension three first by Alan Brennan Lee, and then uh, me, Kasia, and Armin worked on that in the general case. And well, it's not a coincidence that we did it after Neighbor and Valtorta uh, because we rely on their results a lot. And so this is uh, one of the results Mm, I mentioned we have a prescribed boundary data, the corresponding minimizer, and for n minus three, under leaps result, if you look at the n minus three dimensional Hausdorff measure, it's just a counting pressure, right? It's H zero. So it's easier to analyze because there are just finitely many singularities. You just have to say that each one corresponds to some boundary energy uh, and do this uh, in high dimensions is more, it's more difficult. What I wanted to mention, what I think is the most uh, curious aspect of it all, is that this problem is open. It looks maybe, the difference looks random. You see n minus one here and two here. Uh, if you want to generalize this, uh, the first question is, what's the right generalization? This or this? So um, because of, say, uh, scaling, it's easier to work if this exponent here agrees with the dimension of the boundary. This makes things easier. We expect that this is true, but it's uh, substantially, substantially harder. So I will not go into details of, say, the proof, which I don't have. Um, we have some sketches. But let me mention that if it is true, then it's optimal. Because if you make the exponent here a little bit smaller, like uh, three halves, you can have uh, phi, the gradient of phi in L three half, but infinitely many singularities or like infinite size of the singular set. So if you go a little bit, a little bit below W12, it's very, very wrong. Uh, also, as I mentioned, the difference is in uh, scale invariance of the energy. Here, uh, because the exponent agrees with the dimension is scale invariant, in, in the open problem, it's not. And because of this uh, lack of scale invariance, singularities can reach the boundary. Uh, this is a technical difference, but makes the analysis uh, a lot harder. 
But in your result, you assume uh, that the boundary data belongs to W12, not one uh, W1 uh, and minus one. No, no, we proved this. No, but I mean, what is your assumption on the boundary data? Well, th this. Okay, like I'm not saying that I assume this, but if this energy is infinite, then I'm not proving anything uh, interesting, right? So, uh, so yeah, then, then that's. I, I think this is a lot, lot more interesting than what we did. But, uh, more or less, this is what we did as a starting point. Okay, let me give you a sketch of proof to make things concise. I will stick to n equals three case, which was done thirty years ago. So it starts with a boundary regularity lemma, which uh, dates back to Shannon Ullenbeck. So it's classical. If you have a singular point P uh, and its distance from the boundary is R, then if there is a singular point, then the, the energy on the boundary on this portion close to P is at least some epsilon. So it, the energy near P cannot be arbitrarily small, okay? Uh, it's probably easier to think about it in uh, the opposite way. If the energy close to P is very, very small, then you have uh, smoothness inside. Okay? But this will be uh, useful for the proof that goes here. So you can imagine an application of this boundary regularity lemma. If you have some singularities, one here, one here, one here, then each one costs as some energy, right? There's this red region with at least epsilon uh, of this integral. Uh, the same for the green one and the blue. If you sum it up, right, you expect that you, okay, you sum epsilons. So there's epsilon times the number of singularities. And on the other side, uh, well, it bounds from below the energy, right? The energy on this the intervals sums up. So this looks like a proof but uh, it isn't. The issue is that they don't have to align nicely along the boundary. They can stack up one above the other, uh, like bubbles in boiling water. This is what people like to call it, I think. And in this case, these regions that I'm supposed to sum up over, uh, they're not disjunct, right? So this fails miserably. So what you do, what uh, Angren and Lieb came up with, is a refined boundary regularity. So uh, you play the same game, but now um, there's a stronger statement. The statement is that the energy on this region here is at least epsilon, but now you're allowed to cut out a small portion of it. Right? So this ball here is, has size to R, uh, and you're allowed to cut out any small ball that you like and the energy on this region will be at least epsilon. It's uh, actually a proof is similar. Both are proved by contradiction. If it's not true for epsilon equal to one over k, uh, for any k, you take a sequence, you take the, the limit, and you have a contradiction. Here it's the same because epsilon appears both here and here. So in the limit, if you believe in limits, in the limit, the gap disappears, right? And like, you have the same contradiction as before. Um, yeah, this small ball here is called a hotspot, right? So you can imagine that uh, the energy on this part is a, a very, very small, but on this very tiny hotspot, you can have like a million energy, right? very, very large, and it still doesn't affect regularity near P, which could be surprising. And if you have this in your arsenal, then the issue is resolved, right? Uh, if uh, the singularities are one above the other, then you can, under some assumptions, arrange them so that these regions, uh, right? So there's a gap in the red region and the green region is contained inside this hotspot and so on and so on, like a matryoshka. And if you sum it up, right, they're disjoint, yeah, you get the same conclusion as before. What you actually have to do is, well, we use this configuration here, use a covering lemma to somehow uh, uh, connect the, the easy example with this example into one. And then there's an interior estimate. I didn't tell you about singularities far away from the boundary, 
they are somehow easier to manage for technical reasons. Uh, so let it be the sketch. So um, that's the end of part three. And now I will talk not about the size of the singular set, but about its regularity, which sounds contradictory, but isn't. So I already mentioned neighbor and Valtortas and Simon's result about rectifiability, which, which is a, uh, well, it's uh, the notion of uh, being covered by Lipschitz pieces, more or less. Hartenling proved in a dimension n equal three, uh, in if dimension is sorry n equal four, if the dimension is four, singularities are one dimensional, right? Four minus three is one. And so you expect curves and points. And they actually proved that the, the singular set consists of finitely many Helder continuous curves and some finitely many points. In higher dimensions, you expect, well, there's a stratification. So you expect uh, parts of different dimensions. So let us consider just that top dimensional part, which is of dimension n minus three. The remaining part is n minus four dimensional. So it's actually smaller by one, at least. And uh, well, I was able to generalize it to a higher dimension. Also, this was a starting point for proving more about um, the singular set. Once you know that it's a submanifold, uh, you can prove that it's measure. If you look at it at small balls, then the measure is very close to the measure of n minus three dimensional ball. So if you remember this uh, singularity example with a whole subspace of singularities, if you take a ball around one such point, then the measure of it is exactly that, right? It's an n minus three dimensional ball. So uh, this is what you get in the limit. And the main progress, so it seems technical. Yeah, it is technical. But the main progress is actually the lack of holes. What the other results didn't show was uh, that there's a lower bound on the singular set. So we had some upper bounds on the size of the singular set. Being rectifiable is somewhat a regularity uh, property, but it's being covered by Lipschitz, uh, Lipschitz parts. If you take a rectifiable set and cut out an arbitrary part of that, it will still be rectifiable. So it can be some garbage. Um, so a lack of holes is, uh, well, it's not true in general. It's true, for example, in S2. It's true because we know how singularities look like, and we know that they are topologically non-trivial. So here, some very tiny topological argument has to be used. So let me sketch that, uh, that, uh, that argument for you. So let's consider a point in this top-dimensional part. Let it be zero for simplicity. Uh, I will use a black box that if I take a small ball, my map U is close in the sub left sense to the map uh, this uh, right this archetypal uh, map right which is very symmetric up to a rotation. Uh, L will be the singular set of this site. So as I mentioned, the singular set of psi is just an n minus three dimensional subspace. My singular set is, well, something close to it. Another uh, black box. When I say black box, I mean it's something that was proved 40 years ago. So it's hard, but it's something people have known for a long time. So it's not only Sobolev close, it's actually C0 close or CK close. If you get away from the singular set. So there's a tube around L. If you go outside of it, these maps are actually close in any norm that you like. So in particular, there's homotopy, right? Maps that are C0 close uh, as maps into S2, they're uh, homotopy, which is useful. So there is a topological argument uh, showing that if you project the singular set, this one here, onto L, then it covers whole, the whole of L. Maybe, okay, not all, but on a smaller ball. So the proof goes like this. Let us take uh, this red point here on the singular set of Psi. Let us take an N minus three dimensional slice through it, right? So orthogonally to L. 
on this slice, you have an, uh, this tube cuts out an n minus three dimensional, sorry, not, sorry, L is n minus three dimensional. So the slice is three dimensional, which is easier to deal with, okay. So this ball here that I showed, this is a three dimensional ball. And as I said, outside of it, these maps are homotopic. So they're homotopic, you and psi, homotopic uh, when restricted to this sphere here. And if you remember this thing here, on this uh, sphere, our psi is just, well, it's homotopic to identity, right? If you identify the sphere with the unit sphere, uh, it's the identity. So U is homotopic to identity. So it's also non homotopically non-trivial. So it cannot extend continuously to such a three-dimensional ball, right? Whatever, okay? There's a more than one possibility to, to, to extend a disk here, but whatever disk I choose, there will be a singularity on that disk. So in particular, there will be a point here in the singular set of U that projects onto the red point that I chose. So this shows that the hole here, it cannot be, right? Uh, the singular set has to be n minus three dimensional if after projection, it covers an n minus three dimensional set. So this is, um, this is the end of the last sketch. If you have some questions, you can ask now or later. Okay. So what do you really mean by holes? Okay. Yeah. These are not holes in homological sense. Uh, they are holes in a uh, very, very like down to earth yeah. sense that if I have a this can be disconnected. Uh, it can be like okay, the maybe the right thing to say. The right thing to say is that um, yeah, if you take a neighborhood of a point like that, uh, its neighborhood well will be well uh, by Helder or say, homeomorphic to a ball and n minus three dimensional ball, not a ball set minus something, right? Uh, yeah. So yeah, you could rephrase that just as being a topological manifold uh, uh, without boundary, like at least this part. Um, yeah, I think this. So yeah, th this is a hole, right? In the uh, in the most elementary sense of the word, like, it looks like a manifold, but somehow, somehow, sometimes someone cut out a portion of it. Uh, yeah, th this is uh, the word people use here, like no holes. Um, uh, condition, yeah. But basically, it's being a manifold. But like um, the main part is that no one cut out a part of that manifold. Okay, so I will end again with open problems, which are uh, I still think more interesting than the things we know. So we know that the singular set is uh, by Helder. So it's a topological my by a manifold, but it's by Helder with the n minus three dimensional ball with any exponent that you like, exponent smaller than one. It's even by Sobolev, again, with any exponent, if uh, you like Sobolev spaces. And because of that, what we got was uh, this. So the, uh, yeah, like if you take your Sobolev exponent above n, then you can, above n minus three, you can uh, measure the measure of it. So the open problem is going from exponent smaller to one to exponent one. We don't know whether it's by Lipschitz. There are very strong uh, reasons to believe that it is true. And there are reasons to believe that this is true for a very fundamental reason. So to prove that we use something called Reichenberg's topological disk theorem, which is just a geometric measure theory tool, which is very general. It doesn't have anything to do with harmonic maps. And so we expect that this theorem itself can be improved. And like with the same assumptions that we are using it, it can give you something more. And then the last thing, more or less a curiosity. Uh, there was a conjecture by Simon 
that it's not only by Lipschitz, but it's a C1 alpha manifold for any alpha smaller than one. Uh, this was in the 90s. It was announced as a theorem, but the proof never appeared in the literature. I consulted with Leon Simon, and he said that no, uh, the details were never uh, checked. And so, uh, yeah, it's still a conjecture. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank for your attention. Uh, are there any questions? So again, the uh, picture was just the projection to the boundary of the uh, like, the example of singularity. The, 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 the basic example, like this. but uh, when an algebraic geometry sees this picture, they, they see oh, this looks like a rational map, which is not defined at the point zero. You should blow it up. So my question is whether this is kind of a general thing that you can do. Like typically, like if your similar site is like reasonable, like an actual submanifold of of the motion three. We could just off like here it would be like remove the zero, but like into this sphere of sort of radius zero, so to speak. Now you got a little part of boundary, but not as smooth. That's something like a way that you can resolve in general the singularities of a thermal map. Well, what you're suggesting is changing the domain or the target to the domain. domain. Uh, instead of the point where the singularity is, you include the sphere. Now it's a problem because you're saying that every nine minutes, and I will have to change the metric this time. So you should somehow, you know, the skill that you put at the singular point somehow has the general metrics of the nine hundred dollars. But in general, in yeah, in differential, I mean, people do this. This is the bottom move the setting. I don't know about this, but as a general technique. I don't know if that part that I was just trying to use. That's definitely used. I don't know about here. Hmm. In algebraic geometry, sometimes we have a map between varieties, which is only defined in an open subset. Open subsets are very big. The complements of dimension two for you. It's a procedure of doing a certain blow up, changing the domain so that the map is now every, everywhere defined. So it looks um, Superficially, so. uh, people do look closer uh, at these things, but with different techniques. Uh, or all I know, that could be a different point of view. As far as I know, nobody tried to phrase it that way. A lot of people prove they prove that if you have, for example, a harmonic map from an any three-dimensional domain, who is to a minimizing map, then everything below it. At a small scale, up to a rotation, it looks like that mm -hmm. in certain functions, but natural function space norms. So, but I don't know if it is possible to say, okay, let's change the metric, let's remove those points, put in spheres there, and then, then we have a map from a different domain which extends smoothly up to the boundary, and well, you have no singular. Okay, so minimizing. I think a related point of view well, is uh, like something called the harmonic map flow. So what the heat flow is for harmonic functions, the harmonic map flow is for harmonic maps. And the, the, the flow also develops singularities that look like that. And like uh, an epsilon before this singularity happens, you have uh, something that is still smooth. But in the limit, you get something like that. So a picture is um, somewhat like a, uh, yeah, like somehow like changing the domain. Like that, there was uh, you have the domain and uh, say it's uh, a part of it is mapped onto the whole sphere. So you 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 could uh, connect it with uh, looking at the difference in domains. I think. Similarly, for what happens with the Ricci flow, uh, there, there is actually a geometry uh, in it. Um, 
yes, th there is an evolutional point of view which lets us uh, view this from the other side. Is, is there like a SART type theorem, like that for generic reasonable boundary condition and uh, solution, like the solution singularities are reasonable in the sense that well, it's a generic in second mm -hmm. motion three sub manifold and what they need, it's like they, they need a, I mean, singular points of the singular set are also reasonable, so one or not. Uh, Pavel knows more. I've I think no. There are examples where you have boundary conditions, which, from a topological viewpoint, do not force any singularities to that view, like zero degree map from S2 to S2. And nevertheless, uh, for a, I don't know, a dense subset of such boundary conditions you have all maps from S2 to S2, you have as many point singularities as you like. This is pretty strange. This is but still so finite, generally a topic. Finite set. So it's yeah. yeah, but you know you you cannot you 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 prescribe the number of singularities and you say okay in every open set Blah blah blah. In in the space of boundary conditions, you have a map for which you have at least n point singularities, despite the fact that the topology doesn't force you to have even a single one. And so this is something that Kasia did at the beginning. Purple. Purple. Well, <laughs> purple. Yeah. Uh, I can you just say two words about how the uh, why sphere in the target is important? Um, it's hard to say. Most, mostly, it's it's this part here, right? It's it's their fault. Uh, so there there's a lot of examples of harmonic maps but not so many examples of minimizing harmonic maps into different manifolds and uh um well the the proof that almost so that the only possible say singularity which is radial like this one uh the proof was very very special to s2 in a way that doesn't give any picture about what to do with in general case. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very hard to say. But some of your partial results also hold for more general, I mean, for other uh, targets, uh, other targets. Yes, yes. So uh, the part that, uh, okay, everything that we can prove for general target manifolds is because neighbor and Valtorta were able to do this for general target manifolds, which is hard. Um, but uh, all the results uh, that are connected to some good uh, behavior of the singular set, like stability of the singular set of, or lower bounds, lack of holes, all of these are only for us to say S3, which is the same game. If you say that uh, Brazil is, is to blame, then I would say that they consider the liquid crystals here, and you are interested in the position of the director. The director is a part of this. That, that's a good reason why people were interested in the S2 in the first place. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, if there's no questions, let's find the Yes, for the